Hello all, in this video we are going to discuss about common viva questions for clinico-social case of diabetes mellitus. Even though this presentation is going to be question based, let me tell you about the contents of this presentation about diabetes mellitus. It consists of the definition of diabetes mellitus, problem statement, classification types which is the recent update in the classification of diabetes mellitus which is going to be dealt in detail, followed by diagnostic criteria, risk factors, complications and treatment aspect which is also again an extensive topic in case of diabetes mellitus followed by the commonly asked questions in diabetes mellitus. First is define diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus is a group of metabolic disorders due to the disturbances of carbohydrate, fat and protein metabolism and remember it is not alone carbohydrate metabolism it is due to the carbohydrate, fat and protein metabolism all are disturbed which is characterized by the presence of hyperglycemia when treatment is not provided and the root cause of this is due to either defects in the insulin secretion or the action of the insulin or this both can be present. So the definition of diabetes mellitus is a group of metabolic disorder with disturbances in carbohydrate and fat metabolism and the common character is the hyperglycemia whenever there is treatment is not provided and this is due to either defective insulin secretion or defective insulin action or both. So these four components has to be present when we are defining diabetes mellitus. Moving on to the problem statement of diabetes mellitus. There are more than half a billion population affected with diabetes mellitus. Global prevalence reported as per 2019 data is 9.3% but the Indian diabetes prevalence is 8.3% which is just below the worldwide prevalence of diabetes mellitus. Then next we are moving to the classification of diabetes which is one of the recent update in our textbook and also in the classification of diabetes mellitus. As usual, this type 1 and type 2 diabetes remains the same. Type 1, the root cause is the beta cell destruction which is mostly due to the immune mediation and there is absolute absence of insulin and usually the onset will be common in the childhood or in the early adulthood. And the type 2 diabetes mellitus or insulin resistant diabetes mellitus is the most common type. There are varying degrees of beta cell dysfunction that causes insulin resistance commonly associated with overweight and obesity. The classification continues as hybrid forms of diabetes that is slow evolving immune mediated diabetes of adults. Previously this one was called as LADA that is latent autoimmune diabetes of the adults. It is similar to type 1 diabetes in adults but has more features of metabolic syndrome. There is one single autoantibody GAD and there is a preservation of greater beta cell function. The second type under the hybrid form of diabetes is the ketosis prone type 2 diabetes which presents as ketosis and insulin deficiency but later it does not require insulin. There are common episodes of ketosis but this one is not immune related. The other subtypes of diabetes mellitus include the monogenic diabetes which is due to the monogenic defects of the beta cell function or monogenic defects in the betagenic action. These are caused by the specific gene mutations. The clinical manifestations require different treatment. Some occurring in the neonatal, others may be in the early adulthood. Here in the insulin action, it is associated without obesity and the diabetes develops when beta cells do not compensate for the insulin resistance. Then other specific subtypes include diseases of the exogenic pancreas, include fibrocalculus pancreatopathy, pancreatitis, pancreatectomy, trauma of pancreas, neoplasia, cystic fibrosis, hemochromatosis all are included under diseases of exocrine pancreas under diabetes mellitus classification. Now when it comes to the endocrine disorders there are Cushing syndrome, chromegaly, pheochromocytoma, glucogonoma, hyperthyroidism, somatostatinoma all causes diabetes mellitus. These are all endocrine disorders causing diabetes mellitus. When it comes to drug or chemical induced, chemicals interfering with the insulin secretion or action this may be due to glucocorticoids thyroid hormone, thiazides, alpha adrenergic agonist, beta adrenergic agonist, dilantin, pentamidin, nicotinic acid, pyrineuron, interferon alpha. For infection related diabetes, congenital rubella and cytomegalovirus are most common causes. There are some uncommon specific forms of immune mediated diabetes mellitus under which you have insulin autoimmune syndrome, anti-insulin receptor antibodies, Stiffman syndrome all comes under uncommon specific forms of immune mediated diabetes. Other generic some syndromes sometimes associated with diabetes are Di Down syndrome, Frederick's ataxia, Huntington's chorea, Klenefelter syndrome, Lawrence moon Biddle syndrome, myotonic dystrophy, porphyria, prader willi syndrome, Turner syndrome. Towards the end we have unclassified diabetes and lastly the hyperglycemia first detected during pregnancy. 
which is diabetes mellitus in pregnancy or gestational diabetes mellitus. In the first type, type 1 and type 2 diabetes first diagnosed during the pregnancy. Here hyperglycemia below the diagnostic thresholds for diabetes in the pregnancy. Then the, now the next question is, what are the criteria for diagnosis of diabetes mellitus? For diagnosing diabetes mellitus, we have fasting blood sugar, 2 hour plasma glucose after OGTT or postprandial blood sugar, random blood sugar, glycosylated hemoglobin. We can use any of these parameters to diagnose diabetes mellitus, but the criteria for diagnosing diabetes, you can remember in milligrams per deciliter, fasting blood sugar equal to or more than 126, postprandial or two hour plasma glucose after OGTT, greater than or equal to 200 milligram per deciliter, random blood sugar greater than or equal to 200 milligram per deciliter, or if the glycosylated hemoglobin is greater than 6.5, then you can call it as diabetes mellitus. On the other hand, you have a pre-diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance level where the fasting blood sugar will be 110 to 125 milligrams per deciliter and the postprandial will be 140 to 199 milligram per deciliter. This is based on the International Diabetes Federation and WHO recommendations. Now mention the risk factors for diabetes. We have two types of risk factors. One is non-modifiable, another one is modifiable. Non-modifiable risk factor for type 2 diabetes is the genetic predisposition and family history of disease which is most significant risk factor for development of diabetes. Then race or the ethnicity and the age greater than 45 years all contribute to non-modifiable risk factors of diabetes mellitus. When it comes to the modifiable risk factors, sedentary lifestyle or lack of exercise is one of the most important risk factor for development of diabetes followed by obesity unhealthy diets and habits, stress and depression, altered intra uterine environment, environment and environmental pollutants, inadequate sleep along with stress can contribute to development of diabetes mellitus. Next, what are the complications of diabetes mellitus? We can divide the complications into two types that is acute and chronic complications. Under acute complication, the over treatment can lead to hypoglycemia and lack of control of glucose level can lead to diabetic ketoacidosis. The symptoms of hypoglycemia and symptoms and management of diabetic ketoacidosis can be read by the students by themselves. Now under chronic complications we have microvascular complication and macrovascular complication. Macrovascular complication includes nephropathy, neuropathy and retinopathy. Macrovascular complications includes cardiovascular, cerebrovascular and peripheral vascular disease. So cardiovascular disease causing coronary heart disease or heart attacks. Cerebrovascular accidents causes causing stroke, peripheral vascular disease causing TAO and diseases. Now what is the treatment for diabetes mellitus? Treatment of diabetes can be classified into oral, insulin and newer drugs. Oral drugs can be further classified into insulin sensitizer and insulin secretogogue. Insulin sensitizer increases the insulin sensitivity or decreases the insulin resistance. The drugs such as Bigonates, for example, metformin falls under bigonates category. Thiazolidine deones such as pioglitazone all comes under insulin sensitizer. The commonly used insulin secretogogue is sulfonyl ureas, glinates such as repaglinide, natiglinide, etc. DPP-4 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonist all comes under insulin secretogogues. Then we have insulin which can be further classified into ultra-rapid, intermediate, rapid-acting, short-acting, long-acting. So these are all the insulin action profiles. So this is ultra short to longer acting insulin. Now again with the drugs GLP-1 agonist all ends with Tide and DPP-4 inhibitors all ends with gliptins and SGLT-2 inhibitors which ends with liflozins. Whenever you are presenting a diabetic case you need to know the side effect of the oral hypoglycemic drug at least the patient is consuming. So insulin and analogs the common adverse effects will be hypoglycemia, weight gain, insulin allergy and lipoid dystrophy at the injection sites. For sulfonyl ureas, you have hypoglycemia, weight gain, cardiovascular risk, rash, polystatic jaundice, bone marrow damage, photosensitivity all comes under side effects of sulfonyl ureas. We have megalitinides and bigonates where the hypoglycemia, sensitivity reactions, gastrointestinal effects, lactic acidosis will be the side effects. GLP-1 agonist, gastrointestinal effects, pancreatitis, risk for cancer and cardiovascular events are common. DPP-4 inhibitors, pancreatitis, risk for cancer, acute hepatitis and kidney impairment is common. This is the common adverse effects of DPP-4 inhibitors. Thiazolidin dions, hepatitis, cardiovascular risk, bladder cancer, water retention and weight gain are the common adverse effects of thiazolidin dions. Dual PPAR agonist, common side effects will be gastritis, asthenia, pyrexia, 
alpha glucosidase inhibitors gastrointestinal effects and hepatitis are the adverse effects associated and amylin analogs sglt inhibitors the side effects are hypoglycemia allergy glycosuria and cardiovascular concerns are there so you can freeze this slide you can remember the most common side effects associated with the oral hypoglycemic drugs then the most commonly asked question is how will you prevent the diabetes mellitus we have three levels of prevention the question will be targeted at you at the specific level of prevention also where you have primordial primary and secondary primordial prevention you need to mention how it is applicable to diabetes mellitus primordial prevention is the prevention of the emergence or development of the new risk factor in a locality where the risk factor is not present you can do primordial prevention by incorporating exercise and dietary pattern changes for primordial prevention of diabetes mellitus primary prevention is defined as the action taken prior to onset of the disease which removes the possibility of the disease to occur so correction of overnutrition and obesity all can be used as a primary prevention tools then the secondary prevention tools the action which halts the progress of the disease at the initial stage and prevents its complication is called as secondary prevention the routine checking of blood sugar visual acuity urine for ketone and proteins weight measurements all are included in the secondary prevention next important question is about glycated hemoglobin glycated hemoglobin or glycohemoglobin or glycosylated hemoglobin or hba1c or simply a1c is a form of hemoglobin that is chemically linked to the sugar most monosaccharides including glucose galactose fructose spontaneously gets bonded with this hemoglobin when it is present in the blood stream since the red blood cells live for about an average of nearly 3 months this a1c test reflects the red blood cells that is present in the blood stream at the time of the test so that is why a1c serves as an average blood sugar level for the for the recent 100 days so the normal glycosylated hemoglobin level or the a1c level is less than 5.7 5.7 to 6.5 indicates the risk or you can call it as pre diabetes or above 6.5 will be considered as diabetes mellitus the inference is a1c reflects the recent control of diabetes mellitus in the past 100 days we are moving to glycemic index glycemic index of the food is defined as the area under the curve of 2 hour blood glucose response following the ingestion of the fixed third portion of the test carbohydrate usually 50 g as proportion to that of the area under the curve of the standard glucose or white bread this is the technical definition but you need to understand what is glycemic index is the ability of the food to raise the blood glucose level is called as glycemic index so how fast a food increases the blood glucose level is called as glycemic index so here you have high glycemic index food which are not recommended for diabetic patients and low glycemic index food which which increases the blood glucose level on a steady level there is no spike so this low glycemic index foods are recommended in case of diabetic patients what are these low glycemic foods there is a slow release of sugar into the small intestine and absorption into the blood so there is a reduced peak and prolonged rate the example for such low glycemic index foods are the most common fruits and vegetables have low glycemic index except for your potatoes watermelons and sweet corn which has high glycemic index the whole grains pasta foods beans and lentils all have low glycemic index the medium glycemic index sucrose basmati rice and brown rice has medium glycemic index whereas high glycemic index is provided by corn flakes baked potato watermelon some white rice varieties white bread candy bars and syrupy foods all produce high glycemic index apart from increased glycemic load so high glycemic foods are readily digestible and have absorbable sugar which increases the blood sugar level very fast now apart from diabetes mellitus what are the disorders of glycemia impaired glucose tolerance that is the 2 hour glucose levels ranges between 140 to 199 mg per deciliter on 75 g oral glucose tolerance test impaired fasting glucose glucose levels between 100 to 125 mg per deciliter in fasting gestational diabetes mellitus it is any degree of glucose intolerance with onset or first recognition during the pregnancy so this is the basic pathogenesis of how gestational diabetes is developed so during pregnancy there will be increased placental hormones and pregnancy hormones which causes antagonistic action against the insulin producing the hyperglycemia so all these mechanisms leads to insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia causes increased glucose level and gestational diabetes mellitus now what is the criteria to diagnose gestational diabetes mellitus we have different group providing different gestational diabetes criteria and different cutoffs also this is given here so the most common given by ada and who where 
you have glucose dose as 75 mg where the fasting blood sugar cutoff is 95 and 126 respectively for ADA and WHO. Same way OGTT, 1 hour level, 2 hour level will be there for ADA and directly 2 hour level for WHO criteria. And for diagnosis, out of this, 2 out of 4 in NDDG and 2 out of 4 in Carpenter and Kausten, 2 out of 3 in ADA, 1 out of 2 in WHO and 1 out of 2 in AAD IPS criteria will diagnose gestational diabetes. Now this is about syndrome X or metabolic syndrome which is commonly asked both in diabetes hypertension because it is a group of disorder or the syndrome which has insulin resistance, visceral adiposity, atherogenic dyslipidemia and endothelial dysfunction. The individual components of syndrome X consists of waist circumference which is greater than or equal to 1 or 2 cm in men and greater than or equal to 88 cm in women and triglycerides greater than or equal to 150 mg per deciliter HDL cholesterol with the following cutoffs increased blood pressure with these cutoffs and the fasting glucose level with these cutoffs and the diagnosis of syndrome X can be made with any three of the above five features that is obesity, hypercholesterolemia, hypertension and hyperglycemia so we have two parameters for lipid profile together it includes five features any three out of these five features will diagnose syndrome X. Now how to perform food examination in diabetic subjects. First of all the diabetic patients need to inspect the food every day with the help of the mirror or through the help of a person. Basically they need to look for any ulcer, callosus, cracks, scars, edema and any color changes present. So they can look the sole like this and palpate for any temperature difference, any discharge is present or any tenderness is present. Then they need to palpate the dorsalis pedis artery and the posterior tibial artery for the peripheral pulse. Check for the ankle reflexes, vibration sense using 128 Hz tuning fork. So this is the food care recommended for diabetic patients. So we need to educate the patient to do this food care every day in order to prevent serious damage later. Now this is the last question that is what are all the investigations that needs to be done for diabetic patients. So as we told earlier they need to do food examination daily either by self or with the help of a helper and every month they need to do a fasting blood sugar and postprandial blood sugar. It can be capillary and every month they need to do blood pressure measurements and weight measurements. Every three months they need to do A1C test that is HbA1c if the sugar is not under control. If the sugar is controlled the HbA1c needs to be done every six months. And every one year, they need to screen for retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy, peripheral vascular diseases and coronary artery diseases. So the clinical examination include detailed foot examination with the palpation of dorsal speedies, posterior tibial pulses, monofilament and vibration perception testing, retinal checkups which includes fundal examination for retinopathy, blood urea creatinine. LFT for nephropathy, urine proteinuria, albuminuria for nephropathy, ECG for any cardiac complications, lipid profile, hemogram, urine culture needs to be done every year. When indicated, X-ray chest needs to be taken, uric acid, TSH, the other liver enzymes such as SGOT and SGPT, vitamin B12 levels, electrolytes and ultrasound abdomen needs to be done if indicated. So that is about the investigations to be done for diabetes mellitus. Thanks for watching this video. If you like this video, please click on the like button, share it to your friends. If you haven't subscribed to our channel, please subscribe. Thanks again.